thank you all uh, so much for being with us thank on you. this uh, second panel at this ASOCHAM special Beyond the Lockdown Online Summit. Let's move straight across now thank to you. our uh, final panel for this afternoon. We have uh, a panel which will, of course, be concentrating on business continuity management. It's very important uh, to ensure continuity of business. Yes, this is, of course, a historic pandemic. Uh, it is something like the world has never seen before. Lockdowns have affected uh, business continuity, but how do we ensure continuity continues unabated? How do we ensure that economies uh, bounce back, rebound back with uh, renewed vigor? And uh, how do we translate even opportunities in the face of adversity uh, to ensure that uh, our countries and our businesses rise in this new world order that will develop in the post COVID-19 world. Uh, we will, of course, be talking about how industry can be made resilient towards future challenges. Joining us in this uh, special session is uh, Steve Mellish. He's Managing Director, Mellish Risk and Resilience Limited, United Kingdom. We have Dheeraj Lal also with us, Executive Director, Continuity and Re uh, Resilience in India. We also have Rolf von Rosing joining us, Partner and CEO, FOFA Consulting AG from Switzerland. Uh, we have Felicity Marsh also live with us, Director, Security and Resilience, IBM Services in Europe. Uh, truly, of course, a global panel, uh, a panel which, of course, is uh, has, has members from all over, all across the country. Because as I said at the start of the conclave, this is not just uh, a pandemic which is local for us. It's global. The entire world is in it together. The entire world needs to cooperate, needs to fight this virus together. And uh, we need to forge greater synergy as well going ahead. How do we do that? Perhaps that's something the panel can weigh in on. So let me begin with you, uh, Steve. Let's start from scratch, actually, for our viewers and attendees uh, who are joining us. What is business continuity management and how does this help? OK, well, <clears throat> first of all, um, hello, and uh, thank you for having me on your, on your panel, on your uh, summit. Um, yeah, I'd be very happy to start off uh, in terms of talking about yeah, what is business continuity management and, and how can it help? Well, business continuity management has in fact been around for about three decades now. Uh, and it's a very well established, pretty mature management system um, that has um, good practice guidelines um, and uh, standards. Uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's a global management discipline. Um, and essentially what it looks at is um, providing a framework um, to provide organizational resilience. So it will really look at the, um, the, the threats um, and to your business and uh, then focus on the products and services that your business um, uh, produces. And, uh, and as part of the partnership with risk management, which I know we'll talk about a bit later, we'll look at mitigating uh, the threats that are most likely to affect your business. Now, this this is, um, it sounds complicated, but it actually isn't. Um, a lot of it is really quite common uh, common sense, um, but uh, Steve, essentially Steve, you, you need to understand your business. Steve, you can continue, but I also request you to turn on your video if you can. Um, we, we can get your audio loud and clear, and we've of course been listening to, but if you can also turn on your video, your oh, webcam, sorry. yeah, thought, that's perfect. I thought you were in control yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, we were hearing you, yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's an iterative uh, process. Uh, you really start to understanding what your threats are um, and you, uh, from prioritizing, you can then work on uh, plans to minimize the uh, likelihood, but importantly, uh, to minimize impact. And the whole um, program um, of business continuity will include things like incident response, um, as well as uh, recovery you know, the, plan, the development of plans, and really the ultimate is to embed business continuity into the culture of the organization so that it's not seen as something different or special. It's part of a, a, resp a good, responsible way of running an organization that has many stakeholders uh, uh, involved and also protects brand and reputation. Okay, uh, Rob, does that, does that mean then that this is simply for the biggies? 
only. Uh, you know, the big, the big corporate uh, uh, names like IBM, Microsoft, Walmart, uh, Saudi Aramco, Toyota, Samsung. Or, or does this apply then to others also? Well, in practice, because given the lockdown we've seen in Europe, particularly in continental Europe, how SMEs were rather gravely affected by, by what is happening, by the lockdown, by the failure of their supply chains. We have seen federal and state government help coming their way, but at the end of the day, credit is credit and payday will come. So a loss of production or a loss of output will, will affect them more than the big ones. So in terms of applying BCM to media organizations, I believe that there are ways and means of simplifying, being a little more pragmatic around what used to be the big standardized BCM management system, uh, the ISO standards world and such like. And um, with due respect to Steve, what you just said, and Steve and I have been on the BCI board together for, for many years, I do believe that with time, there is bureaucracy that comes in when nothing happens for a period of a decade or two. And we tend to get a little complacent in practice because we see our scenarios before the pandemic, most of what we were thinking of was cyber related, and therefore we went into the direction of cyber resilience. Um, it, at this moment in time, as lockdown is, is uh, being taken back, I, I do believe that we also have to take a big step back, look at BCM as a discipline and make sure that we make it agile and adaptable enough to serve all sizes of organizations. And I think that in India, uh, knowing the country from past visits, it is even more important to understand that just setting policy and setting the rules will not feed the people working in the firms. We need to find an approach that helps them step by step to develop their capabilities, to learn to deal with constraints, and to learn particularly, and I find that important, to understand what the processes are for getting aid, for getting support, for using infrastructure that is there to help them. So in my mind now, the pandemic is a great lesson that we should take to heart, take our key learnings, analyze them, and then maybe modify our thinking and modify our framework to look to the future. That, that's a very important point, and I'm happy you touched upon India there as well, Ralph. Uh, let's take that then at that point to uh, Dheeraj. Dheeraj, are there any regulatory requirements in India actually to implement uh, BCM? <laughs> uh, great question, Uday. Uh, unfortunately, too few. Uh, mostly in financial services, uh, the SEBI has some regulations, uh, more for cyber, to be honest, more than continuity. Uh, the RBI has some. Uh, in my humble opinion, in general, whatever we have is not taken too seriously. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this India Chalta had attitude. Uh, we'll manage the supreme confidence that, first of all, the disaster will not happen to us. It will happen to everyone else, but not us. And if it does, we are also smart that we'll manage. So honestly, even if we don't have full preparation, we can wing it. Um, I think unfortunately, this crisis has shown us that that's not the case. Uh, whereas globally, there are st uh, strong regulations in water and gas, public transportation, energy, supply chain, transportation, logistics, aviation, many others. Uh, the US has regulations that the government must have business continuity. The government cannot be down due to a business disruption. The UK has the Civil Contingencies Act. Uh, you must not allow disruptions to happen, and if you if they do, then you need to do what you can to uh, put them in the past. Uh, the UE BCM is mandatory by law across the country. Each and every entity in the country needs to put in place continuity uh, by law. So I think India has a long way to go. Uh, looking at the call that the PM made uh, to ministries to put in place BCM, um, I certainly welcome that. And I welcome it, and I really request PM Modi uh, to really come out with regulations or guidelines for the country. On behalf of Asset Chair, I volunteer my services, and I know there are plenty of good professionals in the country. So if we truly take this as a wake-up call, I think there's a lot that can be done, and uh, we can really do it very fast once we are committed to doing it. <clears throat> okay. Felicity, I want you to come in here on your, uh, uh, you know, your BCM journey and, and what your insights are on this, uh, on this uh, issue. Uh, that is, of course, gaining a lot of resonance right now. 
Thank you. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I've been in IT since I was six years old when I ripped my first computer apart, uh, and I'm now nearly 50, the right side of 50. So I've seen a lot of things go down, and my job is uh, basically helping out when things have gone wrong. Uh, I'd like to say that business continuity is all the planning and making sure that we're aware of planning, but I think all of us will agree that we were not totally prepared for pandemic planning in terms of business continuity. What I have found is that there is no one policy um, that will work. The whole thing about business continuity is people, processes and uh, infrastructural technology or engineering to make sure that we actually bring things together. What I do find is that with my experience over the years is a very pragmatic approach and making sure you've got a strategic view, a tactical view and a fully operational view as well. That said, I also have been in too many data centres and have had too many phone calls where things have gone wrong that we weren't expecting across the globe, from natural weather disasters to terrorist attacks to actual technology outages, which the impact is, is not just financial but massive human impact as well. So I would say just be practical and what we are staring at now we've never stared at in our lifetime. So there is a lot of things that we are learning on the hoof as we stay in. Okay, um, uh, let me take that in fact to Steve at this point. Steve, there's another term uh, that we've heard called organizational resilience. You know, how is that linked to, uh, you know, to uh, a BCM firstly and, and uh, you know, what should people know about that particular term and its, uh, its, its relevance right now? Okay, well, I mean, what's interesting is, um, and Rolf mentioned uh, just now, the, uh, the Business Continuity Institute, which we, we both served on. Um, I, I think it was back in 2002 that the Business Continuity Institute came up with sort of the first, as I recall, official definition. Um, and what was interesting is that uh, it referred to organisational resilience uh, nearly 20 years ago. And I think the reason for that is that business continuity really has, in my opinion, no limits. So if you're working on IT security, for example, you are focused on IT security. If you are working on health and safety, you are working on health and safety. With business continuity, it's, it's, the reason I love it so much is that it, is a, it breaks down silos and it raises barriers around organizations. And what it does, it, it, it generates collaboration and partnership amongst all of these business management disciplines that collectively are much more effective for an organization. And as a result, organizations will therefore become more resilient. They're more able to adapt and adjust to changing environments. Um, and and, and those, those environments are sometimes self-made, sometimes they're unintentional. Uh, but essentially what it looks at is ensuring that an organization, when it's resilient, can achieve its uh, key strategic objectives and also gives it the ability to um, take on more opportunities as the business grows and develops. So really organisation resilience is a culmination of all of the uh, uh, business management disciplines um, working together more collaboratively, more effectively and business continuity Going back to the point I made about the provide the provision of a, of a um, framework for organisational resilience is a key enabling and facilitating discipline, and I think that's how organisational resilience has developed to uh, a much much uh, more prominent um, term within business, which is a great thing. Okay, uh, I want to take that straight across to Rolf. You know, Rolf, you're, you're coming to us today from Switzerland. Switzerland is one of the most resource-rich countries. Um, how, how much has Switzerland actually been impacted by this current pandemic and, and you know, how have they reacted to it? Well, we, in one of the countries that in Europe, apart from Italy, was, was worst affected by the number of actual COVID cases. So, that gave rise to a popular sentiment of government must do something, which they did. So on the 16th of March, they instituted an almost complete lockdown on the country that lasted uh, up until yesterday. 
Well, there were gradual sort of <clears throat> measures to ease that lockdown as government saw that, you know, the financial and societal impact was uh, something to be considered. And um, I think to all of you out there, you, you need to understand that Switzerland is probably the in the world that has purely direct democracy, as in any part of the populace may stand up at any time and bring this to an initiative and then to the popular vote on a fine Sunday. Um, given that, federal government was uh, much more sensitive to people's feeling and did consider society part of the community that they live in. And if you picture the fact that members of parliament, ministers, uh, the chancellor, even the federal president in our country, uh, go to parliament in session and then they take the tram and the trains home, second class by the way, then you can feel the sense of community that has prevailed and still prevails in, in Switzerland. On the business continuity side, <clears throat> I think that many plans were based on a short-term recovery. Um, they did not necessarily envisage a lockdown of four weeks or longer uh, and the secondary business impact that might arise from that. But what we've also seen is how many sectors of industry together with government, uh, together with the military, have formed uh, an understanding or almost a camaraderie saying, well, we need to stand together in this time of crisis and regardless of our continuity plan, continuity plan sorry, uh, we will need to go the extra mile and we will need to resort to unconventional measures. This is what I'd like to refer to what you said, Steve. Resilience is, is the ability to rebound from adverse circumstances and external shocks. And if you have a societal and a, an economic understanding that says we will have to go to unconventional means and we're ready to do that, then there is a good chance of success. Whereas if you remain in your old patterns of thinking, saying, well, yeah. when can we go back to the old normal, then you're lost. Okay. Uh, Dheeraj, you know, you've actually been advocating, I understand, uh, a four-phase strategy for resilient organizations. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Uday. Uh, in fact, we've come out with a white paper called The Small Fart, Smart Phases of Resilience in Pandemic Times. Uh, phase one is, all, is everything that we all went through. Uh, the COVID hit. Uh, everyone responded. Phase one is response. It's what you do immediately, uh, literally like putting a Band-Aid on a wound. Uh, just stem the flow. Just to try and uh, make sure that things don't get worse, and then buy time to get back to a better life. Uh, phase two is uh, recovery. In a BCM context, that really means bringing up the really critical time-sensitive activities that if you don't do, will really cause you reputation or the financial loss. Uh, many companies, even who were said they had preparedness, struggled with this. Uh, many who didn't, of course, honestly, I think were down for quite a few weeks because a lot of what they needed uh, could not happen in a lockdown situation. Uh, phase one, actually, people could benefit from good crisis management, like the crisis management standard, the ISO 200. Phase two, business country, the BCM standard, good global practices, as we are speaking about right now. Phase three is similar to what ASUCHEM is doing today. Uh, consolidate. Uh, stabilize, let's figure out what more we need to do. Let's be ready at the gate, which is, I think, a classic example of today's session. And importantly, also make sure that we de-risk ourselves from other activities. Uh, we do have cyber attacks even today. We have phishing attacks. There are multiple people saying, give me money because the US is not contributing anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so phase three also is let's ensure that nothing else comes and blindsides us, which causes a disruption again. Phase four literally is be at the gate. As soon as the gate opens, run ahead, be ahead of the pack and just use this bad situation to get ahead as much as we can and perhaps in some ways benefit from it. So that's our four phase strategy. It's on the net, but happy if anyone contacts us to send it out to them. Okay, uh, you, you know, Felicity, I want to come back to you uh, for, for another global, you know, uh, perspective on all of this. Uh, and I want to, you know, we want to, of course, learn from your knowledge of being a global expert. Uh, how have companies abroad been actually dealing with and managing this COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you. It's a very, very relevant question. 
Um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of things. We, first of all, we are seeing the short term impact of what is happening with the pandemic. None of us knew how long our first initial lockdowns were for. So we are seeing from a uh, keeping companies alive perspective, we need to make sure that companies know how to function with everybody being at home. Uh, and some are very, very successfully conversing that have had work at home strategies for very many years. Others uh, have gone to their business continuity plans and realized that actually this does not cover this kind of reaction. However, I am seeing some phenomenal um, uh, reactions. So I was working with a retailer last week that have had to completely restructure how they do warehousing, how they actually look after their staff and how do they make sure they have a return to work strategy so they can continue to function. Like Rolf and Steve, the phrase that I have been saying for many years is you need to make sure you can maintain core purpose and integrity under duress. So where we were looking at let's find we go down and how do we get back up again actually the mentality now is how do we continue to function under duress which at this point is a pandemic now my speciality of course it and cyber resilience as well so little did i think i'd be talking today about real viruses alongside cyber viruses the things that companies are struggling with is the work from home enough capacity for people to be able to properly connect and be able to function we are seeing that the normal informal networks have gone down as well, where people used to meet uh, in the office and be able to communicate. So we're also creating, we're discussing, and one of the things I talk about is digital pathways, so people know the process digitally rather than in reality. We've had some winners in this, in this and we've had some losers. However, um, most people have managed to struggle through to make sure they can be able to function at home big thing now is how do we get people and return back to work to make sure that they are doing it safely and we do not suffer a second peak which we heard um, lots about okay what's the role though steve you know coming back to this uh, bcm that i started uh, the conversation with what's the role of risk management uh, in in your journey in bcm um well as i mentioned earlier um when we were talking about organizational resilience um, the relationship between business continuity and risk management is absolutely critical. Um, when you go into an organization, or if I go into an organization to assist them in establishing a business continuity program, the very first thing that I will want to do, or one of the very first things I will want to do, is meet with the risk management team. And I want to see what the risk registers are for the organization. I want to understand how business continuity currently exists or not, and where it can add value. Um, and so as a starting point, the relationship between business continuity and risk management is absolutely crucial. Um, I think, uh, as, as I mentioned again earlier, the collaboration between risk uh, risk management and business continuity has to continue. It's an ongoing process along with all of those other risk-related disciplines to build that risk organizational resilience capability. The other thing with uh, risk management that is very helpful is that uh, while it identifies the risks, um, the business continuity can make a major contribution in terms of assess assessing impact. This is obviously talking with um, the, the appropriate business owners. Um, but it also, in terms of demonstrating um, the effect of what business continuity is having, it should actually re be reflected in the scoring in the risk registers in terms of the more mitigation that you can provide through a good business continuity uh, a plan or, or, or rehearsal or whatever it is, um, yeah. then the, the risks actually should be going down and to the point where the company's risk appetite is achieved. So there's a, there's a real way of seeing how, that, um, how the work being put into business continuity from a risk management perspective can be demonstrated to business leaders. Okay, I, I just want you to in fact expand Rod, from what Steve was just saying, but by also including perhaps crisis communication into the conversation as well, which is also integral in this uh, BCM journey. Yes, it certainly is. And um, as Steve highlighted, the, the aspects of risk are very important. 
communications are. Another thing, um, if we look back on what happened between, say, early January this year and now, <clears throat> we see a sharp contrast to earlier pandemics caused by the same class of virus, namely MERS 2014 in the Arab countries, the Gulf states, or SARS 2003, which originated in Asia and quickly spread around the world. Given that all these originated from the same class of coronaviruses, we are seeing radically different media and politics have communicated about it, as has the healthcare sector. So both in terms of communicating in public or communicating as a government, um, Right, I, I think a, there's some an initial trouble there. Yeah, okay, that's that's a bit better now, Rod. Okay. All right, sorry. Yeah, I was yeah. saying <clears throat> crisis management is likely to be the same after this one because we used to have the overarching concept of having a crisis escalated to us, communicating about it, and then getting on with our business, basically, and then communicate at various intervals following one and the same strategy. Now, between January and now, and I've been on a couple of crisis management teams, we were faced with increasing loops of further escalations saying, well, perception of COVID-19 as a disease was first seen as, okay, it's manageable, it's like an influenza, we'll do that. But further input from the healthcare sector and from the hospitals show that this was not the case. So we went through a second loop of escalation, having to adjust our communication strategy yes. internally because people were scared, they were in fear, and externally to make sure that we could signal to people that we were indeed taking the right steps rather than just uh, being stuck in that sort of uh, past view of things. And as information came in and act the overall COVID situation, I think crisis had to readjust extremely quickly. Absolutely, and, and, and then that's something that, that's uh, very important at this time in this, uh, you know, in this current setup. Because, and, and I just want to quickly highlight to attendees why this conversation is actually so integral is because there's a lot of risks right now. It is, uh, you know, uh, 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 on obviously a stop that's come in to business continuity because of lockdowns that have been imposed across the world. And, and communication plays a huge role in all of this. You need to communicate with your employees. You need to communicate with industry bodies like ASOCHAM who've organized this conference. You need to communicate uh, then with government as well, who's going to be making policy. We also got bureaucrats. Bureaucracy is very important in this conversation as well. So these are all very uh, integral uh, aspects right now. And that's why we're trying to touch upon all of this in this conversation. I want to quickly go back to Dheeraj at this point. Dheeraj, can you throw some light on the effectiveness of a business uh, continuity management system actually that comes into place? And what role do tools play? Uh, in uh, increasing the effectiveness of such a system. Sure. Uh, thanks again. Um, a business continuity management system is, I would say, pretty much a fail-proof BCM. It's not just about putting it in place. It's making sure that it has all the elements that will make it sustain, which means uh, even more so in a pandemic situation, if for some reason certain individuals are not able to perform these functions for whatever reasons, uh, the BCM still has to go on. So a business continuity management system is uh, is BCM implemented with rigor, uh, with a process, and therefore it takes the person out of it and it makes sure that the system still carries on even if there's adversity. Uh, tools, and I, I this comes exactly back to what you said right now, uh, communication, I'll start with that. Uh, a communication tool can ensure consistent and fast communication to all stakeholders. Uh, very critical in India because the size and scale of Indian companies by and large is pretty huge. In many organizations, India has the largest workforce outside the home country. Um, Accenture, IBM, many others. Um, what worked when you were 100 people will not work when you're 20,000 people or even 50 or 100,000. Uh, that's why you need strong systems that automate. Uh, notification system, for example, can within minutes reach out to these entire 20, 30, 40,000. The same message and even get you back a feedback loop if anyone needs help or their families need help. So if human life and safety is a concern, uh, these tools are in fact great. Uh, 
so that's notification and mass communication and not just employees regulators partners uh, vendors uh, the community the works you can literally program anyone into that similarly automation uh, coming back to your point about bcms a sustainable bcms that will stand the test of time irrespective of the people not being in it has to be automated again very good tools uh, available that ensure that come what may your bcm works and finally a small point on smes what i said is for the large organizations for smes a tool can help you really implement fast cheap literally have a plan in 2 to 3 days it's not the best in the world but at least you're in the game and once you're in the game you can keep improving so okay i want you now felicity to help us solve the puzzle you know how do we fit the pieces together you know uh, from information security to cyber security to a business continuity management system to it disaster recovery etc Oh, now that's an interesting puzzle, and I've got a very interesting perspective on it. So, like I said before, I have to make sure, no matter what the risk is, that I can help companies be able to recover. So, let's try and break these down. IT security is very good at protecting, uh, make it so we're talking about cyber viruses with IT security, but and uh, making sure that. Uh, as has been said before, that uh, the risks are understood, Steve. I'm sure you've seen as many risk registers as I had that have over two or 300 risks that no one's actually looked at until now. Uh, we also have uh, the security team, which is typically looking at the cyber viruses as well as making sure the vulnerabilities of that organization are safe. We also have this new thing called cyber resilience, and this is a very interesting concept, which is assuming that the virus is going to hit and cause damage. So what we've seen in security before is a lot of data theft, a lot of hackers stealing credentials. But now what we are seeing, especially now, and the World Economic Forum has said that these attacks have increased by 50 fold, is destructive cyber attacks and they are now focusing and targeting disaster recovery environments and also backup environments. I'm sure I'll make a lot of people nod when I say backup is very easy, restore is extremely hard, but when we are, what we are also seeing, just to make this even worse, is we are seeing that traditional backup will not protect you from cyber attacks because potentially if there is a virus within your environment, it will be in your backup and it will be in your disaster recovery environment, especially if someone tells me they've got third copy or active active because you spread the love everywhere. So disaster recovery is how do we make sure we bounce you back up with the right amount of speed at exactly the right amount of time. So I actually go into companies and say, what do you need to make sure that you get back up and how quickly? And that is usually people, banks will say access to money, hospitals will say access to patient records, and retailers will say, make sure my website doesn't go down. Or if it does go down, I need it back up in five minutes. What we are typically seeing in the industry is disaster recovery is technology focused. I can recover my app, I can recover my cloud, I can recover part of my infrastructure that I support, where we are now seeing that it's important we protect those data flows. It's not back up and static and restore a data set. It's making sure that banks can access money. And that means you've got to look at it in a non-towered way, but in a sort of data flow way to make sure you bring that part of the business up fast. Sadly, no one has taken disaster recovery seriously, or well, a lot, I'll say the majority is, is not looking at disaster recovery well. Um, when I've looked, let's say I've worked with about 110 clients in 18 months, I found two companies that do disaster recovery well, Every single one has seen it as, a, as an expense, a tick box exercise, and these are the ones that have not survived very well. And we are also definitely looking at a second hit of a pandemic, a virus, and a cyber virus as well. So I would like to Steve then. Steve, if you can, if you could come in, Steve, uh, on, on that point, you know, of, of once again going back to BCM, but also talking now about the challenges, some of the challenges in implementing BCM. Well, I mean, facility set me up brilliantly there to be able to answer that question. Um, I mean, it, it really is um, the fact that it is so hard to get organisations, the leaders of organisations, to say and commit to having a business continuity programme uh, that it's right for the business, that it will improve their organisational resilience. Um, the, I've worked with many different clients in many different industries. The two best, I would say, was in a supermarket retailer in the UK and also a um, electrical infrastructure provider across the whole of the southeast and London. Um, 
and the, the, the difference, the key difference in those organizations was that the CEO said, we are going to do this and I'm going to have, I'm going to have somebody on my board of directors to lead and commit and see this through and hold people to account. And when I say hold people to account, that's not, it's not like being in the army and, and, and be, you know, being regimental. This is about getting people to understand their business responsibility and ensuring that things get carried out. So I would say, and I, I think it's a shocking indictment still after 30 years of business continuity being in, in existence. We're still talking about senior level buy-in and commitment. And that has to change. Um, and, and to me, it's just about being responsible for your organization. You will have a strategy that all of your stakeholders, all of your shareholders will want you to achieve. Now, there are going to be things along the way that will try and stop you, including things like pandemics. But those that have anticipated that through good risk management and good business continuity, they will get over these disruptions much more quickly. It's not to say they won't have some effect they will get over them much more quickly and as a result and as a res and as a result of sometimes competitors falling by the wayside their their buy opportunities arise so that's a big big challenge it's this senior yeah. level buying the only other thing i would say is maintaining momentum a lot of people think and firstly said oh it's a tick box exercise there is a lot of that mindset no, but, but actually, something else is very crucial is uh, rolf top management's commitment you know, to BCM. How do you get a uh, management's commitment for this endeavor? Well, in most cases, it's a three-step process because naturally, C-level executives think they have uh, sort of assumed positions through a mix of skills, intellect, and experience that is uh, head and shoulders above the crowd, as it were, true. But then, in the aspect of uh, risk awareness, of you know, good stewardship, making sure that the organisation is not put at risk or in danger, is a generally understood concept. So many larger organisations now have a chief risk officer. However, the fantasy, or if you will, thinking, and that is step two is that many executives will think, well, everything I could for risk. I've appointed a risk officer, I've put in a risk management system, I'm trying to prevent as much as possible, as much as reasonably possible. For all the other things that I cannot prevent, well, that's a bad thing. Now, step three, and this is what I've seen a positive and then a successful approach. Step three will really find out what the residual risk and the question will usually raise. Okay. Unfortunately, again, we're breaking up there. We're breaking up there. I'll come back to you, Rolf. Uh, you know, Peter, if I tell this guy, quickly come in uh, on what starting X, y, point Z. is and where we can start from. Sure. Thanks. So I'll, I'll, uh, I think it's pretty much a lot of what Felicity, Steve, and Rolf has said so far. I'll maybe just pick up on what Rolf was saying. Um, yeah. Once management has committed that this is what we want to do. As Steve said, uh, the board or the CEO says, we want this done. Then it's a question of making sure everyone in the organization is clear, um, allocate uh, a team, uh, make them understand, get them trained so that they know what they have to do. Uh, that's a challenge because in most organizations, the training happens once the whole activity is over, which, which just misses the whole point. Uh, let them be clear, importantly, empower them um, and make it clear that they will be held accountable give them the time to do it properly, not just a paper exercise where they need to do something, but they have their hands full with everything else and therefore it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, I think critically the business of business is to be in business 
And therefore, if people are clear that this is part of actually keeping the company going, it's my core responsibility, it's corporate governance. Uh, none of us have a desire to cut corners, but if we are put in a position where we are forced to cut corners and uh, we really don't see any clarity about what we're supposed to do, then it's a natural reaction. So as long as there's commitment from the top, uh, people are resourced, they are told what to do. There's a methodology, there's a very clear methodology that works. It's really not rocket science. Uh, there are enough BCM professionals in India who are extremely high quality, uh, enough organizations who've done this pretty well. Um, I think all it needs is a management team to say we want this done. If so, it's a question of, in my view, typically about somewhere between four to six months. But literally every day you actually improve. Uh, so to that extent, the day you start, you've even made the first set of progress. Okay. Um, Felicity, uh, you know, since we're talking about uh, global synergy here, can countries also learn from each other with regards to BCM as well? Uh, and how, you know, how uh, can countries learn to get, uh, you know, to apply this model? What can be the synergy uh, between different global nations as well? Yeah, very good question, and I think absolutely yes. I think countries and individual um, groups of people can learn from each other. I think what we are seeing that used to be IP a few months ago is now people sharing their knowledge and experience and what has happened real time. Um, I would like to see using technology to make sure we share more knowledge and more experience uh, as we develop over the next few months. Um, I am completely with uh, my panelists here in making sure that this is as a priority. So I would go one step further in saying that resilience should be something that is up at the board, owned at the board, business continuity and resilience at the board and make sure that people are doing this properly. The pain that I have seen is the human impact uh, of, of people not taking this seriously enough and the human impact and financial impact the thing that wakes boards up is financial impact first. If I say that you'll be down for weeks in the amount of loss. But yes, we can learn new day, absolutely. But it's down to breaking down the barriers that we typically see in sharing knowledge and experience. All right. Uh, last round of questions now for all of you. Um, Steve, uh, first to you. Uh, you know, five things that, that uh, companies should keep in mind uh, uh, and that should be kept in mind actually while implementing BCM. Okay, well, again, thank you, Felicity. You've set me up nicely to respond to the uh, the question around um, how it can be a global uh, response. There is, um, as I mentioned earlier, there are standards, there are good practice guidelines. The Business Continuity Institute Good Practice Guidelines is almost, is pretty much the global Bible of how to do business continuity. It's been created over the past 15 years or so. It's revised. Um, every couple of years based on changes in technology and regulations and so on and so forth. And it's put together by world leading business continuity experts. And that is how to do business continuity. So there is a way of having a standard good practice approach to implementing business continuity. So that's one of the things I would say to keep in mind when you're implementing business continuity. The other thing is going back to the point I made before is that you have to make this uh, keep this alive with your key with the key sta stakeholders, and that will include the CEO and the board. Um, the the other thing is keep it relevant. So it has to make sure it has to demonstrate that it is enabling the organisation to meet its strategy and its key objectives as an organisation. If it's not if it's doing things that doesn't contribute to that, then there is a very good challenge as to uh, as to why maybe it won't get enough air time. And finally, I think I've only done four, but I think the last one is 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 important, particularly in relation to having a long-term and sustainable business continuity capable capability. You have to really make sure that people don't think there is an end point. This is something that has to be has to exist as part of the organisation, as part of its DNA, and that is how contributing to the organisation's resilience. Those organizations that do this properly and effectively will grow and prosper in the future, regardless of what happens. Okay, Rolf, uh, you know, finally then, is there a difference in approach and what is that difference in approach uh, while implementing VCM in say a large corporate, a medium sized enterprise and a startup? 
Right. I mean, just picking up on what Steve said, I think our first edition was in 2003 of the Good Practice Guidelines. It's now in its or sixth edition. On top of that, for large firms, there is obviously a standard called ISO 22301, which has been around uh, for quite a number of years. And that's the gold standard for certifying larger organizations against the proper ISO world and uh, management system. That is much preferred in large supply chain relationships, public tendering, and such like. Now, for the term, the SMEs who cannot afford the expense or even the effort of attempting an ISO standard, um, my, my suggestion is always what the BCM house looks like, you have to start building it step by step. How do you eat an elephant? Well, chunk by chunk. So if you know what the end point in terms of your management system and your overall framework looks like, then it is a journey of going step by step through the years to populate that house of beasts. And once you've done that, as Steve said, don't stop, but keep your house clean every week, every month and every year. So for SMEs, it is achievable. It just takes a little longer and it may take okay. to reach the maturity levels that you're looking for, but go ahead do it. Okay. Dheeraj, what are some of the pitfalls though that should be avoided? <laughs> Uh, two that I can think of. Uh, the first is uh, uh, a sense of urgency. Uh, you must have a sense of urgency, the pitfall being the delays. Yes, I want it done, but it's okay. Uh, tomorrow, I'll deal with it tomorrow. And of course, tomorrow never comes. So as long as there is a sense of urgency and management makes it important that this is to be done on a timeline, no excuses, I think it'll go well, number one. Number two, related to this, the tendency to, to cut corners, um, so yeah, it, it, let's do this for now. We'll figure it out later, et cetera, et cetera. And for example, training of people is, is a classic example. Uh, in most organizations, it happens once the full thing is done. What's the point? Um, I think as long as we are committing to do the right thing the right way, ensuring the governance around it. Uh, as Steve said earlier, there is someone senior who's tracking it, monitoring it, asking tough questions, beating people up if they're not doing the right things. Uh, it'll go like butter, and if it does, you'll really have a good BCMS, which you will maintain and sustain and keep improving year on year. Right. Okay. Uh, Felicity, anything in conclusion that you'd like to say, uh, or, or should I move to a couple of more attendee questions before we close this this webinar? I'll say, I'll say something very, very quickly. There are three parts, business resilience, technical resilience, and personal resilience. So for personal resilience, there's two things. One, we also we need to make sure that the knowledge of critical systems or critical services are not in one person's head because we are going to be looking at workforce outages. And number two, uh, as I always say to everyone, it's very important that we keep safe and we are kind to each other. All right. Well, uh, before we close, a couple of attendee questions coming in. Let's address uh, perhaps one or two if we can. Um, so here's a question. Steve and Felicity, uh, the challenge today is of access to the work tools. The BCM and work environment at the site is different than the one we're seeing now, where most of the folks are working from home. Your thoughts on this? Who'd like to take that? Steve, would you like to, or shall I? It sounds like a technical opportunity here, Felicity. <laughs> Please do. Yes, yeah, so access to the tools. So let me take that one. Yes, yeah, so access to the tools is extremely different. Um, and I was alluding to what I said earlier. We are seeing that whatever's been written down for business continuity will have to be rewritten uh, to a major degree. So where people are typically looking at a risk register, as we discussed earlier, not looking at their risk register and using traditional business continuity tools, we're actually rewriting the manual as we speak. From a technical perspective, yes, it has thrown up huge and different uh, situations. I've seen companies where they can't access their data centers. I've seen companies that have not been able to access their tools. I have seen outages where we literally have seen 4,000 servers deleted within half an hour and their critical processes and what they do uh, are not there. We've seen suppliers that have immediately declared force majeure and not prepared to support company. So, uh, and uh, I could, Trust me, I could talk to you all day about things that have gone wrong. The things that have gone right are people are adapting and rapidly and the expertise is being shared rapidly across people and we're doing what's needed to be done. However, I think we collectively as an industry in resilience and business continuity need to come together and work out mid-term and long-term approaches 
and make sure it is fundamentally embedded at the top of each company. Okay, uh, there's another question which has come in. I'm an SME and I'm still confused where to begin from. Can you elaborate a bit more, please? Thiraj, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, the methodology has, is pretty simple. Like uh, Rolf said, uh, the ISO 22301 by and large specifies a good approach. Um, it's not different from any other project. Um, figure out the resilience you need, which means identify your really important activities. Um, if you did go down, then what is it that could create permanent damage? Uh, those are the things we should activate first. Uh, so let's make sure that your critical services are time sensitive, uh, whatever you need to deliver is done. It's really about commitments. As long as I know what I'm supposed to do in an urgent situation, then it's a question of figuring out a plan B in advance. I know a certain resource is not available. What other ways do I have to deliver it? So that's our BCM plan. What will we okay. do when we have that disruption and then how to do it? So we can spend one time. Final uh, question. One final question that we can take. Dear Rolf, uh, a question from uh, an attendee. Uh, there is Swedish based MNC and would like to hear from you about how the market demands are at your end and whether companies have started their full capacity of operations and can they meet the supply demand from India in such tough times? <laughs> Ooh, that's a big one. Um, yes, I think once, uh, once we've recovered from the European lockdown, there'll be a great backlog of services that will undoubtedly to a large extent go to places like India. We have a lot of catching up to do, not just in IT, but also in manufacturing, in other services. Um, and I think it's a brilliant opportunity for a huge place like India to provide the best and brightest to make sure that we work together uh, to rebound shortages from the economic uh, downturn. And um, yes, I'm very positive and I, I, I thank the uh, unknown attendee for that question. Great one. All right. Well, we leave it at that. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for joining us on this uh, on this concluding panel of, uh, of the ASOCHAM uh, uh, special uh, lockdown seminar, Beyond the Lockdown and Online Summit. It's the new normal. It's how things are being done. And that's why uh, full marks to ASOCHAM also for organizing a, a complete conclave uh, on online, on the digital space, and uh, uh, from from Musex and from Asocham, thank you, Rolf von Rosing, Felicity Marsh, uh, Marsh, uh, Steve Melish, and Dheeraj Lal. Appreciate all of you joining us today. Thank you to our attendees as well. Thank you to our viewers for joining us. Uh, this is me, Oday Pratap Singh, signing off. Goodbye for now. We'll see you back for more such conclaves in the future too. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good time. Bye-bye. Thank you.